This episode was found wandering the halls of BBC Broadcasting House late at night. All it would say is, Appointment with fear, my friends. Appointment with fear. Listen to it. Pseudopod, episode 594, May 11th, 2018. This week's story, Mysterium Tremendum, part one, by Laird Barron. Welcome to something a little different. For the next three episodes, we're going to be serializing the novella Mysterium Tremendum by Laird Barron. It's a great story, originally published in Occultation and Other Stories in 2010. Laird's an author we're all big fans of, we've wanted to run something by him for a while. This fits really solidly in our wheelhouse, especially after our last couple of episodes. And we've wanted to experiment with the format a little bit, so this really is a only mildly spooky, perfect summation and synchronicity of various events. So here's how this is going to work. It's really simple. We're going to split this across three episodes. Part one this week, part two with a previously, and I cannot begin to tell you how genuinely excited I am to be able to say previously on Pseudopod and have it mean something, there will be part two next week and the big finish two weeks out from now. But first, we really should talk about our author and narrator. Laird was born and raised in Alaska and raced the Iditarod three times during the early 1990s. He retired from racing, moved to Washington in 1994 and became active on the poetry scene. His professional writing debut occurred in 2001, when Gordon Van Gelder published Shiva, Open Your Eye, in the September issue of the magazine of fantasy and science fiction. His debut collection, The Imago Sequence and Other Stories, was published in 2007 by Nightshade Books. In addition to the magazine of fantasy and science fiction, Barron's work has been featured in Sci-Fiction, Inferno, New Tales of Terror and the Supernatural, Lovecraft Unbound, Black Wings, New Tales of Lovecraftian Horror, and the Del Rey Book of Science Fiction and Fantasy, amongst others. He was a 2007 and 2010 Shirley Jackson winner for his collections The Imago Sequence and Other Stories and Occultation and Other Stories. This piece won the 2010 Shirley Jackson Award for Best Novella. He's also a 2009 nominee for his novelette, Catch Hell, and has been nominated for the Crawford, the Sturgeon, the International Horror Guild Award, the World Fantasy Award, the Bram Stoker Award, and the Locus Award. Your reader this week is long-term friend of the show and startlingly talented author, John Paget. John's work dances between Bruno Schultz, Thomas Ligotti, Shirley Jackson, and something truly unique. The Secret of Ventriloquism which is his first collection, is startling. There's really no other word to describe it. We've been honored to run some of John's pieces here, and it is a truly essential body of work. If you want to see the future of horror, and I find it interesting that horror is often a genre where we don't really tend to talk about the future, you're about to hear words written by one of its architects, read by another. Don't mention I love my job. I love my job. So, with John and Laird ready to go, we have the first part of a story for you. And we promise you, it's true. Mysterium Tremendum by Laird Barron 1. We bought supplies for our road trip at an obscure general goods store in Seattle, a multi-generational emporium where you could purchase anything from space-age tents to snowshoes once worn by Antarctic explorers. That's where we came across the guidebook. Glenn found it on a low shelf in the rear of the shop, wedged between antique souvenir license plates and an out-of-print Jenkins' Field Guide to Birds of Puget Sound. Fate is a strange and wondrous force. The aisles were dim and narrow, and a large elderly couple in Moomoo's was browsing the very shelf. And it was time for us to go, but as I opened my mouth to suggest we head for the bar down the street, one of them, the man, I think, bumped a rack of postcards and several items splatted on the floor. 
The man didn't glance back as he walked away. Glenn despised that sort of rudeness, although he contented himself to mutter and replace the fallen cards. So we poked at the shelves, and there it was. He brushed off the cover, gave it a look, then passed it around to Victor, Dane, and myself. The book shone in the dusty gloom of that aisle, and it radiated an aura of antiquity and otherworldliness, like blackened bone unearthed from the Burgess Shale. The book was pocket-sized and bound in dark leather. An embossment of a broken red ring was the only cover art. Its interior pages were of thin brown paper crammed with articles and essays and root directions typed in a small blurry font that gave you a migraine if you stared at it too long. The Table of Contents divided Washington State into regions and documented in exhaustive detail areas of interest to the prospective tourist. A series of appendices provided illustrations and reproductions of hand-drawn maps. The original copyright was 1909, and this seventh edition had been printed in 1986. On the title page, attributed to Divers Hands and No Publisher, entitled Bonderor de Caligenis. Bonderor de Caligenis, Victor said in a flawless imitation of Bruce Campbell in Army of Darkness. He punctuated each syllable with a stabbing flourish, a magician conjuring a rabbit or vanishing his nubile assistant. Dane tilted his head so his temple touched Victor's. But what does it mean? he said in the stentorian tone of a 1950s broadcaster reporting a saucer landing. He'd done a bit of radio in college. I flunked Latin, Glenn said, running his thumb across the book's spine. His expression was peculiar. The proprietor didn't know anything either. He pawed through a stack of manifests without locating an entry or price for the book. He sold it to Glenn for five dollars. We took it home along with two of the fancy tents, and I stuck it in the top drawer of my nightstand. Those crinkly, musty pages, their water stains and blemishes fascinated me. The book smelled as if it had been fished from a stagnant well and left to dry on a rock. Its ambiguous pedigree and nebulous diction hinted at mysteries and wonders. I was the one who translated the title, Modoror de Caligenis means the black guide, or close enough. 2. I'd lived with Glenn for five years in a hilly Magnolia neighborhood. Our house was a brick two-story built in the 1930s and lovingly restored by the previous owner. The street was quiet and crowded by huge spreading shade trees. There was a sheer stone staircase walk-up from the curb and a good-sized yard bordered by a wrought-iron fence and dense shrubbery. Glenn was a junior partner at a software development firm that hadn't quite been obliterated by the dot-com implosion. His office was a nook across from the kitchen with a view of the garden and moldering greenhouse. I wrote articles for the culture sections of several newspapers, and did freelance appraisals for galleries and estates. Glenn got a kick out of showing my column photo around. I wore my hair shaggy, with thick sideburns and a thicker mustache, and everybody thought I looked like a 1970s pimp or an undercover vice cop. I moonlighted as an instructor at a dojo in the university district, we taught little old ladies to poke muggers and rapists in the eyes with car keys and hat pins. Good times. Dane and Victor flew in from Denver for the long-planned and plotted sojourn through the hills and dales of our fair state. The plan included them spending a week or so doing the tourist bit in town before we lit out into the wilds. I knew the fellows through Glenn who'd attended college with them. Dane managed telecommunications and advertising for the Denver Broncos. 
a rugged blonde with a flattened nose and cauliflower ears from amateur boxing matches and tavern brawls. His partner, Victor, was stocky and bald and decidedly non-violent. He'd inherited a small fortune from his parents and devoted his time to editing an online poetry journal of repute. The journal was once mentioned by then-U.S. poet laureate Billy Collins in his weekly column, Victor was a Charles Simic and Mark Strand man, and I liked him from the start. Glenn referred to them as Ebony and Ivory, on account of Victor's resemblance to a young Stevie Wonder, and Dane's being as white as a bar of soap. We threw a party and invited a few friends from Glenn's company and some writer and photographer colleagues of mine. Glenn barbecued steak on the back porch. I mixed a bunch of margaritas in pitchers, and after dinner we sat around drinking as the sky darkened and the stars came out. The big news was Dane and Victor had gotten hitched in California before Proposition 8 overturned the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. This was a year and a half gone by, so their visit was part vacation and part honeymoon. I confess to a flash of jealousy at the matching rings, the wallet of sepia tone wedding photos, and the sea of family and friends in those photos. The permanence of their relationship galled me, and I loathed myself for it. Glenn hadn't proposed, and I was too stubborn, too afraid of rejection to propose to him. I slipped away while everybody was laughing about the wedding hijinks. Glenn sauntered in as I was rinsing the dishes and put his arm around me and kissed my cheek. He was tall and lanky and had to lean over to do it. I'd drunk four or five margaritas in the meantime, and my eyes were watery and doubtless red. He was oblivious, not that I held it against him. Glenn could be tender and thoughtful and wasn't so much indifferent as clueless. Despite his interest in classical music, literature, and art, and possibly less wholesome but no less cerebral fascination with the esoteric and the occult, he didn't like to think very deeply about certain things. His father was dead, a career railroad man, second-generation Irish. He dropped in his traces from a heart attack when Glenn was 15. Glenn's parents had known he was gay since grade school, and they accepted him. Everything came easy. He cheerfully took what we had for granted, as he took everything else for granted. The guy read books and worked with strings of code, for Christ's sake. Truly a miracle he possessed any social graces whatsoever. As for me, my father had been a white boy from the Bronx who served 30 years in the army, the last decade of it as a colonel. My mother was a former Brazilian teen queen bathing beauty who married Dad to get the hell out of her hometown. Dad passed away in his sleep from an overdose of pills a few weeks before I met Glenn. I sometimes wondered if it had been accidental or closer to the protagonist's opt-out in that famous little novel by Graham Greene. Mom pretended I'd court a fine young lady one day soon and sire a brood of kids. My three brothers were scattered across the world. The eldest kept in touch from India. Otherwise, I received birthday cards, the odd phone call or email, and that was that. Glenn kissed me again, hard and on the mouth, and he tasted sweetly of booze. I wiped my eyes and grinned and let it go like I always did. Gnats and mosquitoes descended. The guests retreated to the living room. Glenn put on music and began serving another round of drinks from the wet bar. I fetched Motoror de Caligenis and took it to my office. An examination of the book revealed phone numbers and mailing addresses amidst the other text, although considering the edition's publishing date, I assumed most were dead ends. In tiny print on the copyright page was a line that read, Submissions with a P.O. box address in Walla Walla. Meanwhile, the party was in full gear. Between songs, raucous laughter floated to me. My CDs, Glenn preferred classical music, Beethoven, Chopin, Gershwin, Sibelius. 
That wouldn't do at our casual get-togethers. Somebody sang along to the choruses of Neil Sedaka, Miles Davis, and Linda Ronstadt, a step behind and off-key. Dalton, our grizzled tomcat, jumped onto the easy chair near my desk and went to sleep. Old Dalton was a comforting soul. I hunched over my computer monitor and ran searches of key phrases from the book. A guy in Germany claimed there were numerous versions of the Black Guide. He'd acquired editions for regions in France, Spain, Portugal, and South Africa. A college student in Pullman wrote of a friend of a friend who'd used the book to explore caves in Yakima. That struck me as odd. I wasn't familiar with any notable caves in Washington. Another man, an anthropologist named Berman, explained that several of the entries provided contact information for practitioners of the occult. During the late 1990s, he'd visited some of these persons and joined them in seances, divinations, and fertility rituals. He was currently a professor at Central Washington University. On a lark, I sent him an email, noting I'd inherited a copy of the guide. The most interesting item I retrieved during my three lonely hours at the keyboard was the journal of an individual from Ellensburg who went by the handle of Rose. Rose started her journal in April 2007. There were three entries. The first talked about not really wanting a journal at all, but keeping one on the advice of her therapist. The second was a 2,500-word essay on her travels abroad and eventually finding the Black Guide at a gift shop in Ellensburg. Apparently, Rose had sought the book for several years and was elated. The guide contained a listing of secret attractions, hidden places, and persons, quote, in the know, unquote, regarding matters esoteric and arcane. In the final entry, she mentioned packing for a trip with three friends to the tomb on the Olympic Peninsula and would make a full report upon her return. The journal hadn't been updated since June 2007. Nonetheless, I left an anonymous message inquiring after her status. This satisfied me in a perverse way. It felt as if I'd thrown her a lifeline. I signed off around 3 a.m., Glenn was already in bed and snoring. I lay beside him and stared at the pale reflection of streetlights on the ceiling. Who was Rose? Young, pretty, wounded? Or maybe not. The kind of girl who took pictures of herself in period costumes. Pale, thick mascara in her rhinestone purse, a deck of tarot cards she'd inherited from an older woman, a long-lost sweetheart. Rose was a girl with many friends and lovers, yet who was usually alone. I pressed the black guide against the breast of my pajamas and wondered where she was at the moment. I dreamed of her that night, but in the morning, all I remembered was flying above an endless forest and the rocky bluff of a small mountain and into a cave that swallowed me whole. Three. Come on, tell Willem a Tommy story. Glenn wore a loopy smirk. He'd done one too many shots of Swervo. Oh, yes! Victor pounded his empty glass on the table. Okay, okay. Here's one about Thomas-san, Dane said. His hair was tussled, his cheeks were flushed. He eyed me with an intensity that indicated such a story symbolized a great confidence that I was on the verge of admittance to the inner circle. This was in the early evening after hiking up and down Queen Anne Hill since breakfast, peeking into shops, trying the innumerable bistros and pubs on for size, and yelling raucous comments at the construction boys ripping apart the sidewalk in front of the Phoenician Theater. Now we were just off campus at a corner booth in a dimly lighted hole in the wall called the Angry Norseman. We'd drunk with the vigor of sailors on shore leave the entire day and were almost sober again. A gaggle of college students in University of Washington sweatshirts congregated at the bar and overflowed the tables. It was getting rowdy. Who the hell is Tommy? I said. A short, stubby guy who took six years to graduate, 
Glenn said. Older than us, balding, but he had this Michael Bolton thing going on, hair down to his bum, managed a pizza parlor. Mean son of a bitch, Dane said. He'd get drunk up and pick fights with the frat boys. One of them whacked him in the head with a golf club, just pissed him off. I remember that, Glenn chuckled and licked the salt from his wrist. He downed his tequila. His eyes were bright. Cops locked him in the tank overnight and slapped him with disorderly conduct. A real lovable asshole, Dane said. Glenn said, he got killed water skiing a couple of years ago. First time out, too. Strapped on a pair of skis and got his neck broken. Fifteen minutes later, tried to jump a ramp. Don't know what the hell he was driving. All their fault, you know. Holy shit, I said. Glenn patted my hand and shrugged. Whole thing was moronic. Sort of fit, though. He was gonna go out from a rotten liver, a motorcycle accident, or a prison fight. It's just how it was with the crazy fool. Wait, that's... Victor closed his mouth. Dane said, Anyway, this isn't really a Tommy story, per se. We had this other buddy named Max. Oh, Maximus was a real coxman. And he was cozy with this little rich girl who was going to an all-girls school in the other end of town. A real honey. Here, here, Glenn raised his glass. Glittery green eyeshadow, Catholic schoolgirl skirts, and thigh-high lace-up boots. Rough. <laughs> right, right, Becky Rimmer. You're kidding, I said. Her name was Rimmer. Kind of unfortunate. Her folks were out of town, and she invited Max over through the weekend, and me, Glenn, Tommy, and Vicky latched on. Becky didn't like it much, but what the hell was she gonna do? So we arrived at the house, and man, it's posh. A gaming room with a kick-ass sound system and a stocked bar. We were in seventh heaven. She laid down the ground rules. Be careful with the new pool table and hands off Daddy's scotch. No problem, Max promised. Becky disappears with Max for some nookie. First thing, Tommy, who's already high as a kite, decides to shoot some pool. <laughs> He misses the cue ball and digs a three-inch groove in the felt. And the booze? I said. Dan pantomimed, guzzling from a bottle. <laughs> Thomas had her old man's supply of doers in his guts in short order. Pretty quick, Danny boy gets bored and decides to check on Becky and Max, who've locked themselves in Daddy's den and are making like wild animals. Tommy. Gets some tools from the garage, and the next thing we know, he's standing on a stool and drilling a hole in the door to make a peephole, laughing like a lunatic, sawdust piling on his shoes. Victor said, Me and Dane dragged him away from the door and gave him some more booze. Uh, things are going okay until there's a crash from the tin, and Max starts hollering. <laughs> Turns out he was banging the girl on a glass coffee table, and at the height, of the rumpy pumpy, it shattered and she dropped through. They were going at it doggy style, so she sliced her arms and knees. Nothing serious, but it looked awful. Blood and jizz everywhere. Yeah, Dane said. A scene from one of Takashi Miike's films. Naturally, we took her to the hospital. The docs gave her some sutures and bandaged her head to toe. Many awkward questions were asked. Max drives her home and the rest of us split. Mom and Dad get back early. Becky's lying in bed, trying to think of a story when she hears her mom in the study go, Oh, my God, what is this filth? And as Mommy Dearest comes through the door waving her daughter's soiled undergarments, from downstairs her dad bellows, Who the hell drank my doers? I laughed so hard my side ached. What did she do? Girl was a soap opera junkie. She just squinted and said in a pitiful whisper, Mommy, Mommy, is that you? Glenn bought us another round. Conversation turned to the impending trip. Victor unfolded a sheet of paper and showed us notes he'd made in heavy pencil. On the itinerary was a day hike on Mount Vernon, a tour of the Tacoma Museum of Glass, a leisurely day in the state capital of Olympia, then a blank slate. There'd definitely be a night or two camping on the peninsula. Where was yet to be settled? Victor said, That leaves us some days to check out the sites. Maybe visit Port Angeles?
After much non-committal mumbling from the three of them, I took the black guide from my pocket and thumbed through the section on the Olympic Peninsula. The Lavender Festival in Sequim is coming up. Port Angeles is close by and Lake Crescent. Glenn and I stayed at the lodge a few years ago. Gorgeous scenery. Absolutely, Glenn said. Victor said, I hear it's spooky. The Lady of the Lake murders? Oh, that was ages ago, I said. Albeit it made me uneasy that I'd recently read a passage in the guide documenting the scandalous tale. Too many coincidences were accumulating for my taste. Dane took the guide and turned it toward the dim lamp hanging above our table. He grinned. Vicky, look at this. Victor leaned in and scanned the page. Dane said, This thing is a kick in the pants. Says there's a hotel in Centralia where they hold seances once a month and a dolmen up a trail on Mystery Mountain. See, I said, we should put Sequim on the calendar. Go visit this dolmen after we see how the lavender jelly gets made. What's that anyhow? Dane said. A prehistoric tomb, Glenn said. There aren't any dolmens in the state. Maybe I'm wrong, but it sounds fishy. He spent an inordinate amount of time cruising Wikipedia. Up a trail, eh? About 17 or 18 miles up a crappy road, more like. The Kalimov Dolmen and Cavern. There are some campsites. It's on the edge of the preserve. Victor stroked his goatee. Dane said, This is a seriously cool idea. I gotta see it. I gotta. He poked Victor in the ribs and laughed. Come on, baby. This sounds awesome, don't it? Victor agreed that it indeed sounded awesome. Glenn promised to arrange for a bed and breakfast in Sequim and to make a few calls regarding the mysterious dolmen. If nothing else, the park seemed as decent a place as any to camp for a night or two. The guide mentioned trout in the mountain streams. I wasn't much for the sport, but Glenn and Dane had dabbled in fly fishing. Once I got the guide back, I studied the entry on the Kalimov dolmen and its attendant notes in the appendix which included references to celestial phases and occultation rites. I didn't know what any of that stuff meant. Nonetheless, we'd have lively anecdotes for future vacation slideshows and a story to tell, I was certain. 4. Glenn and I frequently made love the first year we were together, not so much later. We were perpetually exhausted because of project deadlines, hostile takeovers at the workplace, and of late, the ever-shrinking newspaper circulation. Glenn had climbed the ladder by dint of overtime and weekends. I still received more commissions than I could shake a stick at. Familiarity took its toll as well. Once Dane and Victor arrived, Glenn tried to fuck me every night. That hurt my feelings. I knew he was jealous of Victor. Victor was a flirt, and he came on to me in a not-too-serious way. Glenn laughed it off. However, when the lights dimmed, he was also a territorial son of a bitch, and it aroused him that they were screwing like rabbits down the hall. I tried not to let it bother me too much, although I drew the line at him groping me while dead drunk. That night, after we piled into a cab and finally made it home from the angry Norseman, I smacked his hands away as he kept grabbing at my zipper. He persisted. I lurched downstairs and crashed on the couch, a maneuver I hadn't resorted to since our last real argument the year prior. There was a special on the History Channel. A crack team of geologists and a film crew were mucking about Spain, exploring caverns and whatnot. My eyelids drooped. I slowly emerged from a doze to hear a man discussing holy rites from the Klalem tribes and other ancient peoples of the Pacific Northwest. He described burial mounds along the Klalem River and the locations of megaliths and dolmens throughout western Washington. I was confused, second-guessing Glenn's assertion that no ancient megaliths or dolmens existed in our state, but the narrator continued. Of particular interest is the Kalimov Cavern site near Mystery Mountain National Park. The Kalimov Dolmen, named after Dr. Boris Kalimov, who discovered it in 1849, is remarkable in its size and antiquity. A relic of the Neolithic age, 3000 BC, perhaps older. 
A word of caution is in order. There is a dangerous... The monologue faded, and someone wailed in pain. I lifted my head, and the room was full of blue, unfocused light. The television screen skipped, and ghostly figures shifted between bars of static, soundless because I'd hit the mute button prior to nodding off. Every channel was full of snow and shadow except for the ones with the black bar saying no signal. Unsettled, without knowing precisely why, I rubbed my eyes and went to the window. The neighborhood was blanketed in darkness but for a scattering of porch lights. The cityscape was hidden by the canopy of the trees. I hugged myself against an inexplicable chill as I attempted to recall the odd commentary of the dream. Turning, I saw a man sitting in the armchair in the corner near the pine shelf that housed a meager selection of my books. A burst of light from the TV screen revealed this wasn't Glenn or our guests. I was woozily drunk. The top knot, the surly piggish features, the short bulky frame was precisely how I had envisioned the inimitable Tommy of college lore. He reclined, mostly concealed in shadow, but I saw he was naked. One thick leg folded across the other to artfully cover his manhood. His flesh was very pale, the flesh of a creature who'd dwelt in a sunless grotto for ages. He raised a finger to his lips. I've just come to talk, he said, imparting menace with the over-enunciation of each syllable, hinting that on any other day I'd experience something other than conversation. Scream, and our buddy Glenn is going to come running him. He'll trip over Vicky's jacket on the top step and roll down the stairs. It'll be a mess, trust me. I wiped drool from the corner of my mouth. The horrible vision of Glenn falling, shattering his spine, kept me from yelling. I said, you're him. Call me Tom. Tom? Can't be. Didn't say I was Tom. I said, call me Tom. Got any hooch? That's a rhetorical question, by the way. I shuffled to the kitchen and immediately noticed the cellar door ajar by several inches. The way down was via a narrow wooden staircase missing its railing. The cellar itself was small and cramped and mildewed, and we never used it. I took a bottle of Stoli from the cupboard. I poured two tall water glasses a finger below the rims and carried them to the living room. In the back of my mind, I'd hoped this would break the spell, that I'd snap out of this somnambulant state and find the visitor had evaporated. He hadn't. Tom accepted the glass and drank half of it in one long gulp. I sat on the couch, elbows on my knees, clasping my own drink with both shaky hands. Why you? I, I don't get it. Why you and not my granny or my dad? He shrugged. I said, it's because of that story tonight. <laughs> Real double-breasted asshole, wasn't I? He said and laughed. Your granny and your old man don't have anything to say to you, I guess. You're making assumptions about where I come from anyway. This ain't like that. See wings on me? Horns? Maybe an American werewolf in London made a bigger impression on me than I thought. Next time we meet, your face will be a melted pizza. Love that fucking movie, damn. That nurse was hot. For months, I got a boner every time I heard a shower running. She didn't do much for me. I suppose not. What's going on here? I could use a smog. Drinking and smoking go hand in hand. My old man was black Irish, like Glenn's. We black Irish smoke and drink and beat our wives. Tommy laughed, grating and nasty. Glenn quit. I don't smoke either. Sorry. Tom stared at me through the dark. His eyes glistened in the blue radiance of the TV, brightening, dimming, disappearing with each flicker of the screen. There was a hateful weight in that stare. Dang smokes, he said. So go ask him for a smog, I said. He laughed again. You wouldn't like what happens. I had another vision, a confused, menacing premonition that sickened me even though I couldn't see anything but weird, jerky movement in the shadows and a smash close-up of Dane's eyes growing too wide. 
I walked into the kitchen and rummaged in a drawer until I found a pack of cools that had been squished under the silverware tray since forever. I lighted a cigarette on the burner, returned to Tom, and handed it over. He said, mm, Tastes shitty like a cigarette should. I had set my glass on the arm of the couch. I drank the rest of the vodka while Tom smoked. A sulfurous stench filled the room. You play with Ouija boards when you was a kid, Willem? I nodded. Sure, in high school, I bought one. Uh, Parker Brothers. Hell, all you need is a piece of construction paper and a glass. They work. Ouija boards. Other things, too. Like that book you've been dicking with. It completes a circuit. I snapped my fingers. I knew it. The book. Right on, Ace. The book. The Black Guide. You've been fucking around with it, haven't you? If by fucking around with it you mean reading it, then yeah, I have. Come on. Those drawings in the back. You didn't copy some of them? Maybe scribbled a few of those weird doodads that look like hieroglyphics onto scratch paper? Tried to sound out some of those gobbledygook Latin phrases. You're a nerd? Of course you did. He was right. I'd copied a diagram of a solar eclipse and its related alchemical symbols into my moleskin journal with the heavy enamel pen my younger brother bought me back when we were still talking. I'd also made dozens of curlicue doodles of the broken circle on the cover. There was something ominously compelling about that ring. It struck a chord on what I could only describe as an atavistic level. It spoke to my inner hominid, and the hominid screeched and capered its distress. What if I did? Did I do something wrong? My voice was flat and metallic in my ears. I sounded strident and absurd. He said, Remember the golden rules. Action equals reaction. The crack that runs through everything stares into you. Big fish eat little fish. Night's agents watch you, ape. Yeah? Why are you here? Why are you warning me and not your chums? Their idea to use the book for sightseeing, not mine. I'm not here to warn anybody. I'm here to give you a good old mind fucking, among other things. Think you found the book by accident? There are no accidents around here. Time is a ring. Everything and everyone gets squished under the wheel. I don't understand. Then you, my friend, are an idiot. And friend, keep going the way you're going, and maybe a friend will slice your heart from your chest and take a bite out of it like a Washington's best in the name of the first power. That's how friends are. This is an idiotic imaginary conversation, I said. There wasn't anything imaginary, however, about the searing alcohol in my burps, or the fact my head was wobbling, nor the flutter-flutter of my heart. Shoo, fly, shoo. Tom didn't answer. The cherry of his cigarette dulled and blackened. A split second before his shape merged with the darkness, it changed. The room became cold. A woman said, There are frightful things. I couldn't tell where the whisper originated. I finally gathered the courage to switch on the lamp, and I was alone. Sleep was impossible. I made a cup of coffee and crept into my office and ran a search on the Kalimov Cavern, the Kalimov Dolmen, and Dr. Kalimov himself. There wasn't a record of a dolmen of any kind in Washington. Boris Kalimov turned out to be no doctor at all, but a rather smarmy 18th century charlatan who faked his academic credentials in order to bolster extraordinary claims made in his series of faux scholarly books regarding naturalism and the occult. The good doctor's fraudulent escapades came to a sad end thanks to French justice. He was convicted of some cryptic act of pagan barbarism and confined to a Parisian asylum for the remainder of his years. As to whether any of Dr. Kalimov's treatises mentioned a cavern or dolmen on the Olympic Peninsula, I'd likely never know, as all were long out of print. However, Mystery Mountain National Park was indeed where the Black Guide indicated and open for business until mid-October. Glenn scrambled eggs for breakfast. 
He didn't comment on my absence from bed. I spent enough late nights at the computer he scarcely noticed anymore. He was hung over, all of us were. Pale sunlight streamed through the window and illuminated our chalky faces as we sat at the kitchen table and sipped orange juice and picked at scrambled eggs. The whiteness of Glenn's cheeks, the raccoon dark circles of his blank eyes startled me. My own hands shone for a moment gnarled and black-veined as if from tremendous age. I gulped a whole glass of juice, coughing a bit, and when I looked again, I saw it was only an illusion. I'd seen it before, watching Glenn sleep, with the light illuminating him in such a way that his future self, the wrinkled senior citizen, was forecast. 5. Glenn's Land Rover was a rattletrap, sky-blue hulk. He'd driven the rig exactly four times since purchasing it at an estate sale in Wenatchee some years prior. Normally, we tooled around in his Saab or rode the bus. The Land Rover had bench seats wide enough to host a football team, a huge cargo bed, and smelled of mold, rust, and cigarette smoke. Hooray, Victor said when Glenn backed it out of the garage. Let's get this safari started. September was unseasonably warm. The Land Rover lacked modern amenities, including a CD player and air conditioning. I sat in the back with the window rolled down. Everybody wore off-the-rack Hawaiian shirts, a gag dreamed up by Dane, and sunglasses, designer shades for my companions. For me, a cheapo set I'd gotten at an airport gift shop. I also strapped on a pair of steel-toed boots, as I usually did when away from home. One never knew when one might need to stomp a mugger or other nefarious type. Victor wore a digital camera on a strap around his neck. While drinking one night, he'd confided parlaying his access through Dane's position to the Broncos' sideline into almost 2,500 close-up pictures of the cheerleaders in action. He was toying with the notion of auctioning the album on the underground channels of the Internet. I thought there were already plenty of candid cheerleader shots floating around the Internet. Then what did I know? The voyage started well. Victor even pronounced a soothsaying to that effect. Sun and moon augur a favorable and erotically charged escapade. I said goodbye to the cat. A neighbor would pop in and feed him every day and locked the doors. The hiking trip to Mount Vernon was a relaxed affair as none of us were hardcore outdoorsmen. We had a picnic in the foothills and returned to the lodge well before dark, where we played pinochle with some other tourists and drank beer until it was time to turn in for the night. Glenn and I got into bed. He typed on his computer while I labored over the essential Victor Hugo, the Blackmore translation. My problem was less with Hugo than the nagging urge to dig the black guide from my suitcase and have another go at the procession of peculiar diagrams in the appendices and to attempt to tease more meaning from the enigmatic entries and footnotes. I'd told Glenn about my encounter with Tom, careful to frame it as a weird dream. Glenn frowned and asked for more details. He was intrigued by the occult fascinated to learn of the secret lives of the famous artists I studied. His interest in such matters waxed stronger than mine. Alas, his patience for wading through Baroque texts wasn't equal to the task. Upon listening to the tale of Tom's apparition, he'd muttered, What does it mean? He was too calm, obviously throttling a much more visceral reaction. Whether this deeper emotion was one of sympathy for my strange encounter or worry that my screws were loose, I couldn't tell, and I'd said, I was drunk, it didn't mean anything, while thinking otherwise. Tom indeed referred to cigarettes as smogs, a fact I'd been unaware, and thus a detail that lent creepy and disturbing authenticity to the encounter. Dream or not, I hadn't cracked the book for three days. I imagined it burning a hole in the case, a chunk of meteorite throbbing with sinister energy. The next day, we spent a few hours at the Tacoma Museum of Glass, then soldiered on to Olympia for a desultory afternoon of wandering the streets and poking around the cafes and boutiques. While my companions were sipping iced coffees, I stepped into a used bookstore and investigated the regional history and travel sections. I got into a conversation with the clerk on duty 
a bored ex-librarian who stirred to life when I showed her the guide. She adjusted her glasses and made ticking noises with her tongue as she flipped pages. I've heard of these. Farmer's almanacs for pagans. The ex-librarian was tall and thin and wore cat's eye glasses with pearly frames. Her hair was black and straight and her hands were bigger than Dane's. She asked where I'd gotten the book and seemed disappointed that I couldn't remember the name of the store in Seattle. I asked her what she made of the appendices, directing her to the drawings and arcane symbols. Well, I'm sure I can't say. She shut the book with one hand in the resounding manner they must teach in library school. She smiled obliquely. Perhaps you should visit one of the individuals listed in Modoror de Caligenis. Such a person could doubtless tell you a few things. Long shadows lay across the buildings when I rejoined everyone at the sidewalk table. My iced coffee had melted to a cup of slush. I envisioned the ex-librarian's hair swept into a raven's wing over her bony shoulder. Her simple blouse and capri pants transformed into an elegant evening dress some vamp in a hammer film might toss on for a wild night at the castle. Her smile smoldered in my imagination. Clammy and unnerved, I suggested we repair to the hotel and change for dinner. The Flintlock Hotel, established 1895, was a brick and plaster building set back from Capitol Boulevard between a floral shop and an antique furniture store. The boulevard was lined with trees, and a mini U.S. flag rustled on every light pole between downtown and the Tumwater Bridge. Glenn had rented the McKinley quarters. This was on the third floor, overlooking the street, a cozy number with a sitting room, bedroom, and two baths. There were all kinds of frontier photographs and frames, and the place smelled like roses and Douglas fir. Dane and Victor got the Monroe suite down the hall. Same decor, same layout, but a view of the alley. I told Glenn I had a migraine. Concerned, he volunteered to cancel our dinner plans and stay in to watch over me. I was having none of that. What I needed was a couple of hours rest. Then I'd join him and the boys for drinks and dancing at one of the clubs. He ordered warm milk and aspirin from room service and waited with me like a perfect deer until it arrived. He watched me take the aspirin and drink the milk. He felt my forehead, then left with his jacket slung over his shoulder. I waited five minutes, then dialed the anthropologist at his office. We'd arranged to talk a couple of days beforehand. Dr. Berman answered on the second ring. Look, this guide, it's special. His voice was rough. I pictured him alone in the wing of a large, decrepit campus museum, a disheveled academic wearing a tweed jacket and thick glasses, slouched in a chair at a desk cluttered with papers and a skull paperweight. His office was lighted by a single lamp. He was smoking a cigarette, a cheap bottle of whiskey in arm's reach. Say, any notes in the margins? Um, pages 80 through 110. That'd be the chapters on the Juniper Dunes, Olympia, the Mima Mounds. Yeah, I said. So that was you. I, I can't read your handwriting. Neither can I. His chair creaked in the background. I got the impression he was pouring from his bottle and congratulated myself on being so damned clever. I said, why did you get rid of the book? I didn't. My assistant accidentally put it in a box of materials the department donated to the University of Washington. It was some months before I discovered the mistake. The university had no record of its arrival. If I may ask, where did you find it? I told him. He said, odd. Well, perhaps I could inveigle you to return it to me. To be honest, it might fetch a considerable sum on the collector market. Likely more than I can afford. I'm not interested in money. Sure, I'll send it back. After our vacation. Where did you come across the book? In the foothills of the Cascades. I was backpacking with friends. They knew of this cabin near an abandoned mine. Supposedly, a trapper dwelt there in the 1940s. The place was remarkably intact, albeit vermin infested. The book lay at the bottom of a rusty footlocker, buried beneath newspaper clippings and magazines. Passing strange. A hiker must have hidden it. I often ponder the scenario that led to such an act. 
While he talked, I reflected that anthropologists and their ilk came by their reputations as tomb robbers honestly. He got cagey when I inquired after his experiences with the pagans mentioned in the book. Ah, uh, all I can say is some farmers here and there cleave to ancient customs. More country folk look to the sun, the moon, and the stars for succor than you might think. The nature spirits and the old gods, they don't advertise what with Western culture and Christianity's persecution of such traditions. This latter comment struck an unpleasant chord. I said, the good folk don't advertise except in the little black book. You mean cults, Satanists? Those two, I suppose. I don't know firsthand, but to my knowledge, I never met any. My boyfriend tells me Washington State is a hotbed of satanic worship, I said. By the way, have you visited the Kalimov Dolmen? The what? Page, um, 72? The Kalimov Dolmen on Mystery Mountain. There was a long pause. I don't recall reading that entry. A dolmen? Ooh, hard to believe I'd missed something so important. Well, the guide has a peculiar effect. The font is so tiny. He hesitated and the bottle and glass clinked again. This may sound nutty, but be careful. As I said, I met decent folk on the main. User-generated content has its perils. There exists a certain potential for mischief on behalf of whoever anonymously recommends an attraction of service. Look sharp. Sure, Doc. We said goodbye, then I blurted, Oh, wait, I, I, I meant to ask you, do you happen to meet any of the folks who've owned the book? There's a girl in your area, Rose. That's her online persona. I gave him the rundown of Rose's journal entries. Hmm, doesn't ring any bells, Dr. Berman said. She found the book in Ellensburg. Oh, I taught there for a decade. I wonder if she was one of my students. A striking coincidence, if so. Please, keep in touch. We said goodbye again for real. Tree branches scraped the window. A street lamp illuminated the edges of the leaves. I checked my watch. The good doctor had seemed in a hurry to end the conversation. Maybe he knew more about the anonymous journalist than he admitted. I unzipped my suitcase and lifted Motoror de Caliginis in its swaddling cloth from amid my socks and underwear. I unwrapped the guide and set it on the table. Boy, you do get around, I said. A shiny black beetle, easily the size of my thumbnail, crawled from the lumpy pages. It scuttled across the tabletop and fell to the carpet, shriveled in death. Six. I went downstairs to the lounge and started to tab with a double vodka on the rocks. The place was small and half full of patrons, yet full of mirrors, thus it appeared busy. Behind the bar, there was a big photograph of three loggers standing in the sawn wedge of redwood. The trio had short hair and handlebar mustaches. Two of them leaned on double-headed axes. The third logger stood a swede saw on end so it rested against his shoulder. The men wore dirty long johns and suspenders. I finished my drink, and the bartender set me up with another without my asking. A guy in a cream-colored suit sweated on the crescent dais under blue and gold lights and crooned a Marty Robbins ballad about the life of a 20th century drifter. I loved Marty Robbins, but I always hated that song. Hey there, stud. Victor squeezed my arm as he slid in next to me. He wore a cardigan that smelled of smoke and aftershave. The bartender brought him something pink with an umbrella floating in the middle. Where are the other musketeers? I said. Victor toyed with the umbrella. Athos and Porthos are flirting with a bevy of cute tourista chicks at the Brotherhood Tavern down the street. Totally yanking the poor girl's chains. Too hilarious for me. I bailed. I laughed. How cute are they? He shrugged, sipping his drink and smiled back. Not at all, really. Dane's hammered. I told him if he gets drunk and obnoxious, I'm Audi 5000. Let Glenn drag his worthless carcass back to the hotel. I said, hear, hear, and drained my vodka. I crunched the ice and watched the door. The lobby was dim, and the doorway hung in space, a black rectangle. The singer finished his set with cool water and big iron. 
He made his way from the dais and slumped farther down the bar. His toupee was bad, and he'd pancaked his makeup far too heavily. His face seemed familiar, but I couldn't place it. Victor asked the bartender to put his drinks on our bill. The singer raised his glass and grinned at us, and I saw that his dentures were as cheap and awful as everything else. Poor bastard, I said, and went to work on my third double. I still smelled the acrid odor of the cools I'd given the phantom visitor of a few nights prior. The memory of the scent made me ill. It also made me crave a cigarette. I've got an odd question. Yeah, okay, shoot. That friend of yours who passed away, Tom? He into anything, I don't know, for want of a better term, weird? Such as fortune-telling, magic, uh, anything of that nature? Victor gave me a long, wondering look. He shook his head and laughed. Oh, hells yeah. Didn't Glenn ever tell you? Man, we all got into that shit. Tarot cards mainly, but I really dug cultural anthropology. Those dudes get into spooky situations. And the poets of yore, Keats and company, can't read the classical poets without coming across funky ideas. Anyhow, the whole point of college is to experiment. Did I ever? Anything heavy? Like black magic? Voodoo? We joked around, but no, nothing heavy. Tommy Boy was extra flaky. Dane and I tried astral projection with him in this deadhead girl, Lawanda. Tommy kept cutting up until we quit, and Dane went and scored some weed to keep him quiet. What about you? Are you a true believer? I'm a theorist. <laughs> Thing is, I've been studying that guidebook we got in Seattle. I seen that girlfriend. A hoax, I'm sure. I bet you anything it's a novelty gag. Somebody printed a couple dozen of them like pamphlets and scattered them to the winds. I considered enumerating the reasons his theory didn't hold water. The book materials were too expensive to suggest a joke. Its articles and essays were too complex. I refrained because my tongue was getting thick from the booze and also because I wanted him to be correct. He said, what's Tommy got to do with the book? Not a damned thing. Popped in my head for some reason. You didn't care for Tom much, huh? He was cruel to me. Dane and Glenn were his boys. None of us called him Tom, by the way. In fact, saying it aloud gives me the chills. His father called him Tom. Used to beat his ass or something. Dude was touchy about that. He's in my dreams a lot since the accident. That's understandable. You should get some grief counseling if you haven't. Victor rubbed his bald head and gave me another look. But I didn't like him. I said, doesn't matter. He's part of your life. In those dreams, what does he want? He doesn't want anything. He moves in the background like a ghost. That makes total sense, though. The irony. I'm at a party with Dane. The party's in a posh Malibu house, one of those places that hangs over a cliff, and the host is my second grade teacher, except he's actually a cinematographer or a, or a screenwriter named Rick or Dick. He's got a star on the boulevard. I mingle with all sorts of people I've known. Weird combinations of grade school classmates and high school sweethearts, janitors, the, the chick who used to pour coffee at an all-night diner on the corner, a guy who dealt weed from the back of his El Camino when I lived in North Portland, uh, some hookers who hung out near my friend's apartment, and famous dead people, Ginsburg and Kerouac, uh, Johnny Cash and Natalie Wood, Lee Van fucking Cleef. Then I'll spot Tommy in a corner or on the deck, maybe lurking behind some bushes. Sometimes he's watching me and I'll try to go talk with him. He disappears before I get there. Victor's diamond ring sparked like fire. I knew he was lying because of how he leaned away from me. Not wholesale lying. Some of it was true. The ice had disappeared. I signaled for another drink. My lips were numb. Always a bad sign. My forehead was cold, and that meant I was afraid. I thought about Tom and the beetle and the pentagram in Appendix B of Modoror de Caligenis. I thought about the rough pentagram I'd carved into my desk with a penknife. I'd done it without thinking and covered it with the keyboard afterward, ashamed. This double shot didn't last long either. How did he die? Really? Water skiing? Come on, man. Victor glanced toward the door before signaling the bartender. I need another one. 
He waited until a fresh drink was in hand to continue. Look, I wanted to let you in on this the other night. We invented the water skiing story. Dane invented the story. I think he and Glenn have convinced themselves that's what actually happened. Ah, oh, Dane's gonna wring my neck. We agreed to let it be. Tommy fell into a sinkhole. We'd camped in the hills, a couple of miles from here, in fact, and were hiking some trail. A lot of it blurs, you know, traumatic stress syndrome or whatever. One minute Tommy was behind me, the next he was gone. The hole wasn't much. I doubt he ever even saw it. Rescue teams came the next day, but the thing was too deep and too unstable. The proverbial bottomless pit. They didn't recover the body. I admit, me and Dane and Glenn freaked. After we finally got our shit together, we didn't talk about it at all. First time somebody asked, Dane smiled and told them the skiing whopper. Couldn't believe my ears. I didn't argue, though. I went along with it, except... When Glenn was telling you that, frankly, that shocked the hell out of me. You two are serious. You're serious, aren't you? That's the most horrible thing I've ever heard, I said. Victor nodded. Pretty awful. Thomas didn't suffer, at least, poor bastard. You didn't see him fall? I don't know why it occurred to me to ask. But he fell. No other explanation. I, I doubt the guy slipped into the bushes and faked his own death, living in Maui under an assumed name. Nah kind of puzzled why you guys still want to go camping after an experience like that. Me, I'd burn my hiking boots and backpack in a nice bonfire. Don't be silly. We've gone camping a half dozen times at least. Honestly, I see it your way. Dane and Glenn, those two are macho, macho, macho. What happened to Tommy just made them more bullheaded and foolhardy. Dane wants to go tramping the Indonesian backwoods next year or the year after. Please, God, no. Snakes. Spiders, diseases. I might take a pass. Uh huh. And he'll wind up hitting on some 18 year old stud muffin islander and blame it on the booze and loneliness. Ha! <laughs> yeah. He'd actually blame it on me if he cheated, which he wouldn't. He's well aware I carry a switchblade. You carry a switchblade in my sock. Not that I'd use it. I'm too pretty to fight. Although, if D decided to fuck around, I might make an exception for his balls. I'd had enough. My body was jello. Victor and I leaned on one another as we walked out of the bar and into the elevator. He gave me a sloppy goodnight kiss that landed on my ear as we parted ways. I crawled under the covers and slept, but not before I spent a few unhappy moments envisioning Tommy lying in subterranean darkness, his legs shattered. He screamed and screamed for help that wouldn't arrive. I said, yes, for the love of God. The Pacific Northwest is a magnet for the strange. Just ask our colleagues over at Public Radio Alliance about how weird it can get. It's interesting too that whilst the sense of place is so completely different, this story is absolutely in lockstep with last week's piece by Tamsin Muir. You get the same sense of something colossal brushing against human consciousness, the same feeling of boundless space bounded by something very, very far from human. But you also get something more proactive. Where Muir's piece is made by the patient mousetrap at its center, the longer length here affords Baron a chance to spend some time preparing his victims. So we get the complex interactions between the couples, a refreshingly non-showy approach to their sexuality, and an unblinking look at the problems they face. We feel, inside five pages or so, like we know them. And then the curtain gets peeled back, and while we know these people, we realize we don't know their lives at all. And we don't know why they're so interested in the occult, although Baron does tell us, indirectly. The book, what it contains, slowly turning the temperature up. Slow enough that no one notices, slow enough to entice the characters in, proactively hunting them without ever looking like it's doing anything. Predator and prey, and we are not in the first group there. Can't wait to see what happens next. While you wait for the next part of Mysterium Tremendum, you can slake your thirst for more of Baron's work by picking up some of his other great fiction. This story originally appeared in Occultation and Other Stories, 
which is an excellent collection. Don't just take my word for it, as it was a finalist for the Stoker and Locus Awards and won the Shirley Jackson Award. Included in this collection is Strapato, which is the torture take on anarchist performance artists that we've all wanted. Also, 30, which is the basis for the film They Remain. Further included is the Broadsword, which is another of his Children of the Old Leech cycle, as is Mysterium Tremendum. Or if you've read everything of his already and can't wait for more, pre-order the upcoming thriller Blood Standard. This novel is the answer for those of you who have been looking for more fiction that will scratch the same itch as True Detective. While there are no blood cults obsessed with the works of Robert W. Chambers, we get a similar nihilistic perspective with cosmic horror lurking at the threshold. As I have come to expect from Laird Baron, it never condescends to the reader and ratchets the tension with inexorable doom. The pacing and action are excellently crafted. If you read the novella Procession of the Black Sloth and wanted more unsettling crime investigations, this is the novel for you. If you haven't, you can find that story lurking in the Imago sequence and other stories. Pseudopod relies on you to pay our authors and cover our server costs. If you like this episode, there are three things you can do. Two of them, donating or subscribing via PayPal, and donating to our Patreon both get you access to our Warehouse 13-esque vault of premium content. Plus, you get access to the audio feed over at Patreon, where Karen Bovenmeyer and I regularly dork out about awesome things and guest stars like Podcastle's own Setsu swing by. Or if money's tight, you can still help out. Reviews help so much you would not believe iTunes, Google Play, blog about us, tweet about an episode any of it. If you can't donate, you can still help, and we need both, so if you can, please lend a hand. We'll see you next week for part two of Mysterious Tremendum, when, as now we will be a production of Escape Artists Incorporated, released under a Creative Commons Attribution, non-commercial no derivatives, 4.0 license I think. If you want an idea of just how weird the Pacific Northwest can get between then and now, Google Pacific Northwest Tree Octopus. It's worth it. And we'll see you next week.